V1. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Terrain. Welcome to the Flight Safety Detectives. Hosts John Golia and Greg Fife, two of the world's most respected aviation safety experts, talk all things related to aviation and aerospace. This podcast and the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel are brought to you by the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, PAMA, and Avemco Insurance, a world-class provider of aviation insurance and your one stop for all general aviation insurance needs. Get a customized quote at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Tell them you're a listener of the show and receive a 5% discount. Now it's time to buckle up because it's wheels up for the latest episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Well, hello, John. Good to see you for another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. It feels like forever since we've been on here, but you and I were traveling together a week ago, um, shooting off our mouth about aviation and aviation safety on the maintenance side of the house. But you're fresh off of your maintenance competition, and sounds like uh, you had a record turnout, and um, the competition was outstanding. Yeah, I think that the uh, the competition was really outstanding. Uh, the number of students and military. Uh, and FedEx won the overall for the air, air carrier side. It, it was just outstanding. We we uh, we had about 800 people attend. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. We had uh, around 350 or so competitors attend, and of course, then there was a lot about 92 support people, judges, and all that. So it was a it was a very busy uh, week out there between setting up all the all the testing, 27 different stations for testing, and then judging them and then uh, getting the scores. It was a lot of work. Yeah. And I to be honest with you, on uh, Thursday night, I was glad it was over. Uh, there was yeah. a lot of us physically exhausted. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. But I think the uh, the thing that you and I talked about that came out of this was the young people that got hired. Yeah, we know for sure there was twenty five people that that uh, have have final interviews. The way the way the airlines do it is that uh, they'll look at you, evaluate you, and they'll bring you into the final interviews, so you don't have to go through uh, the multiple step process. So it shortcuts it, and. Uh, we identified about 25 students uh, that went that way, but we're told that the real number was closer to 40. Wow, that's and awesome. Some of the things that are surprising were uh, one of the colleges, A&P schools in uh, Northern Florida, had their entire senior class, as they said it, go to space. So they're working for either SpaceX or Lockheed Martin or, or any of the, the uh, new space companies. And also, 50% of the next class has already been hired to go to space. So although I hate to see that, that large amount of manpower sucked out of the possible airline business, which we're hurting for people, but I'm glad to see that still in aviation and they've got a bright future ahead of them. That's great. And for those uh, that are watching the show and listening and you have a passion for maintenance, uh, this is the place to be because uh, you do get the visibility. And as John just said, um, you can shortcut the process because the airlines are there in full force. That's their kind of, uh, you know, it's their scouts, really. I mean, when you think about it for a football analogy or a baseball analogy, you, this is a great scouting competition and, um, and they can see you in action. And next thing you know, you're going to be talking a, a job. So I think that uh, that's, uh, that is the real benefit to this competition, other than the fact that you have a lot of unsung heroes. You know, the maintenance guys don't get a lot of credit. They, don't, they aren't out in the forefront. The pilots always are, good, bad, or indifferent. And uh, this is definitely a way to showcase their talent, their skills, abilities, and the knowledge, not only as individuals, but as teams. And, and like you said, John, FedEx won it overall, but all of the teams that have come in there um, all have 
a high level of expertise. And so it's not like they're losing by hundreds of points. They're losing by tenths of points, if you will, when it comes to the competition. One, one year, not too many years ago, we had one point different between first and second. So we had to tighten the schedule, uh, the, the testing up. We had to ask to uh, make the testing, some, some of the testing more robust so we could drive that, that gap open. Because that one second could have been just a, a slow hit of the, uh, the stopwatch on the part of a judge. Yeah. So it, yeah. It's, it was interesting. And all those guys that, that uh, showing their talents and gut jobs and really make all of us that work so hard to put this on feel good. Because we do it for the kids. We don't do it for FedEx and we don't do it for American and United. Uh, we do it for the kids to get them a, the start in the career. And that's what it's all about for us. So we, we left there quite happy. Well, congratulations, my friend, on a very successful competition. Sounds like it's going to get bigger and better for next year. And, um, and I know that you had a lot of foreign uh, participants as teams as well. So I'm hoping to see that grow. So next year I can make it. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't, uh, wasn't able to get down there, unfortunately. And I'm looking forward to being down there. So um, with that being said, given the fact that we are talking maintenance, we're going to dissect a maintenance accident, a maintenance-related accident, in which uh, a DC-8, super DC-871, formerly a United Airlines airplane that uh, ended up as a cargo hauler working for Emory Air Freight, uh, crashed in War Rancho Cordova, California in February of 2000. And I was the investigator in charge on that particular accident. Uh, we got the call. I was in D.C. I was on duty at the time, had the team spooled up. The airplane had crashed around midnight uh, local time in California. So when we got notified, it was the middle of the night on the East Coast. Uh, we went through our proverbial uh, call. At that time, we didn't have a real sophisticated uh, call network. We were using the FAA's bridge system. So everybody got up on the bridge. Uh, we briefed what we were going to do. We were transported out there the following morning early uh, by the FAA uh, G4. We had the team with us. We arrived on scene and um, there's a number of pictures and we're going to post some of those pictures on the uh, website uh, of me and the team initially getting out to the accident site briefing with the first responders and getting a lay of the land because this particular accident, we needed to have the lay of the land because the airplane had crashed shortly after takeoff and crashed into an auto salvage yard. Um, so given that, uh, we needed to really understand what we were working with and, and things like that. But to open this up, why don't we talk real quick, John, about some of the history the maintenance history of the airplane prior to this flight. It had been in for heavy maintenance. Uh, they were working on the tail feathers of, of the airplane. The airplane was returned to service, but there were some additional issues that uh, were handled locally by Emory. Can you just describe you know, what that was before I get into talking about what the scenario was once that airplane was put back into service? So the airplane was in for a heavy maintenance visit not too, you know, not terribly long before this accident by a, by a repair facility down in Tennessee. And they were well-versed in DC-8 maintenance. And they did all the Emory's and put in, in Burlington Northern and, you know, all the carriers that at that point in time were big on using uh, these stretch DC-8s because they could carry a lot of freight. And uh, they did work on the tail. And when the airplane came out, sometime later, just, just within a week before the crash, some additional work was done on the weekend when Emory doesn't fly the airplanes. And in this particular case, uh, I should mention at this point that in the 70s, I worked for Emory on their freighters. So I was, I was well-versed in, in uh, how they operated. And uh, this particular DC-8 had some write-ups about elevator uh, feel. So they determined that the 
uh, dampeners, the elevated dampeners, because there is no gust lock, the dampeners uh, needed to be replaced. So this mechanic, and I'll talk about this mechanic right now. All right, so he's a young guy. He got his license in the three months before the crash, and maybe not even that long, but I'll give him the three months before the crash. And he worked for a contractor on, on these airplanes. And he got hired by Emory a month before mm. the accident. And he's working a weekend, he's all alone, and he's got these dampeners to change. Now, if you follow the maintenance manual, those dampeners are a tough task because you've got to take the elevator off. You at least got to pull it back out of the way. And somebody told him, and we don't know who, that you could get them out on some of these airplanes if you disconnect the trim tab so that you, that piece of linkage doesn't limit the travel of the elevator and, and get it out of the way you can put the elevator in such a position you can remove this the dampener without removing the elevator. Hmm. And it's not every airplane you can do that, but with many of them you can't. So that's what he did. And he was able to change the dampness and uh, reassemble it. But upon reassembly, he made two mistakes to the same nut and bolt. All right, so the first mistake he made was we were taught in A&P school. You and I just challenged the, uh, the audience. We were at MDAA, and we challenged the audience if they ever heard about when you put a bolt in uh, something on an airplane, if it's horizontal, the head of the bolt is towards the center of the airplane. Right? If it's vertical, the head of the bolt is on top, so it doesn't fall out. <laughs> right? Simple. The mechanics that were in the room that we for our presentation, they knew that. I don't know that this young man knew that. But in any event, he put the bolt in the wrong way with the head towards the outside and the and the uh, the nut on the inside. Now, because it's it's a flight control, you don't have a self-locking nut on there. You have a castellated nut, which means you've got to put a pin down inside to lock it because you can't squeeze it down to make it tight. So you snug it up and, and put a cotter pin in it to lock it in place. That was the second mistake. Now, when they designed the DC-8, it was designed years ago under, under the civil air regulations, not the FAA regulations. And that airplane uh, had a cover over this linkage. And this cover was also an additional safety. This little cover, would not allow the bolt to step out. So not only did the did the uh, the cotter pin and not supposed to be the, the the locking device, this cover, which just fears it, is also designed so that your butt, even if the nut comes off, the bolt can't leave. It keeps it captive. Right, and of course, uh, all of the, that safety piece was negated because the bolt was put in the wrong direction. And when, we, and when we think about this, John, it sounds very simple, but like you said, you got a guy working alone, he's relatively inexperienced. Um, he's trying to get the airplane, or at least his portion of the airplane done because he knows that that airplane's got to go back online Monday morning. And, um, and, and so again, is it self-induced pressure? Are there time pressures? Is it, he's never done this before? Is it that he's embarrassed to ask questions of other people just to make sure he's done all of these things correctly? Um, the question I have is where is the inspector? Uh, not a required inspection item. All right, now it really wasn't a required inspection item because you've disconnected a flight control. Mm -hmm. But that's not part of the procedure. The procedure, if he followed it, would have required an inspector. Okay. But he didn't follow the procedure. He, he followed what I think was instructions he got from somebody. Mm. And how often do we see that where, I, I won't say people are making up <laughs> the, the procedure, but they aren't following, of course, the established procedures that have been approved. Uh, by the manufacturer in the FAA in the interest of time 
in the interest of efficiency, if you will. We've seen this alone. You and I talked about an accident where the mechanics on a DC-10 hung an engine you know, with a, a newly developed procedure that they thought would expedite things. And unfortunately, they lost the entire engine and we lost a DC-10 in Chicago because of it. Yeah, and, and that had an engineering involvement, actually. The engineer was right on the floor telling them what to do. So just because you have an, an engineer present, you know, there's no no substitute for procedures. And so I've that, lived through all, I've, I've lived through a lot of that myself. So now we got an airplane. It's returned back to service after this procedure had been accomplished. Uh, the flight crew picked the airplane out of Dayton. They ended up flying it to Reno, Nevada. And from Reno, they ended up heading to Rancho Cordova. The airplane was then going to head back to Dayton, Ohio. Um, it was a three-man crew. Uh, of course, captain, first officer, flight engineer, and a deadheading captain on the flight from Reno to, uh, to Rancho Cordova was going to be the ca uh, flying captain for the flight from Rancho Cordova back to Dayton. So he's on the airplane. They land in, in Rancho Cordova, but the crew had written up that on landing, they had a hard time flaring the airplane. The flight controls were real stiff and uh, they pounded the airplane in, <laughs> on landing not hard enough to do a hard landing inspection, but it was significant enough that the crew felt that they needed to write it up and at least have a mechanic look at it. So the airplane is sitting on the ramp. They've offloaded the cargo. They're putting a, a new load of cargo on and uh, the mechanics go out there and do their thing. Now, of course, this is around 11 o'clock at night. So it's dark and of course, they don't have all of the bright lights like you would typically see at a big sort facility that FedEx has and, and places like that, where the, they illuminate the entire ramp and every airplane out there. So now you have mechanics trying to walk around an airplane, uh, looking up underneath the tail section, which, how high is that tail, John? 25 I think feet? At least 12 feet. Yeah. So, you know, you're looking at 12 to 15 feet where you're trying to look up for the smallest of things, they, they don't see anything. Meanwhile, they're still loading cargo and they're about 20,000 pounds under gross when they uh, finally finished the, the cargo load. Uh, the mechanics didn't see anything obvious. They didn't repair anything, didn't do anything as far as turning a wrench on, uh, on the airplane and wrote the, uh, the maintenance write up off and returned the airplane to service essentially. The, uh, the new crew gets on the airplane. First officer is going to be the flying pilot. You have a captain who has about 13,000 plus hours total flying time, quite a bit of it in the DC-8. So they go through the, uh, the briefings and they fire up and they're taxiing out. Now on the taxi out, first officer is going to be doing the flight control check. And in the DC-8, this is an airplane that's push, push, pull, uh, push tubes and, uh, and cables, right, John? Yep. So now he's, he's in there and he's going he's gonna to flex his muscle and he's going to do the uh, flight control check. So he starts to exercise the flight controls, pushes and pulls on the control yoke, turns the ailerons, and of course kicks the rudder to, uh, to make sure everything is solid, but it's all moving unrestricted. The one problem he didn't do, and this is what we got off the cockpit voice recorder, is that we believe that he never compared those movements, especially in the pitch, um, with the little peanut gauge that sits at his left knee on his side of the panel. If he had exercised the, the elevator as he basically did, we could hear it and we can see movement on the flight data recorder. Um, he would have known if he had looked at that little peanut gauge that when he did push the control yoke forward or pulled it back, he actually wasn't moving that elevator in the back of the airplane. Most likely he was pushing and pulling against the spring tension in the system. Correct, John? Yep. The artificial field portion. And so now he thinks everything is good to go. Um, and they usually do that kind of check relatively quickly. Uh, they get to the end of the runway. They uh, line up, they push the power up. First officer is the flying pilot. He pushes forward on the control yoke. 
uh, as the airplane starts to accelerate. And as they go through their call outs, 80 knot airspeed alive, all those call outs, they get to VR, except the airplane started to lift off on its own. And that is definitely unusual and counterintuitive to the way we fly airplanes. This airplane, the nose started to rotate up and you can see on the uh, flight data recorder data that in fact, he is the first officer is starting to push forward on the control yoke as the airplane is rotating up, which again, that is so unusual. And we saw that and it was verified by the, uh, the flight data recorder data, but it also was confirmed by the flight crew as the airplane began to pitch upward and the first officer is pushing more forward on the control yoke to try and get the nose down. He's saying that he can't control it. And as the airplane starts to pitch up, he's trying to push, the nose isn't coming down. They know they got an issue. They don't know what that issue was. They believed that it may have been a cargo shift because that is one of those same symptoms where if the cargo shifts aft and you get a very aft CG, you're gonna have an uncontrollable pitch up. And that's what they believed it to be. So- uh, And in fact, that's what we believe too. It led us astray for a little while. It did because all we had to work off of was the cockpit voice recorder information and the radio call to ATC saying, hey, we think we got a cargo problem, cargo shift, FCG, we need to come back. While they are transpiring through those conversations, first officer is still trying to push the nose down. He tells the captain, okay, you fly the turns. That is, you, you handle the ailerons. Now, the flight engineer is watching all this take place. He slides his seat up and he starts manipulating the throttles. So now you have all three of these pilots working a separate flight control, trying to get this airplane under control. So as they make the turn, as we all know in aviation, if you start to turn, the nose will naturally fall. So the captain's flying the ailerons, he rolls the airplane into a left bank turn, the nose starts to fall. Meanwhile, the first officer's got his feet up on the, on the control column, trying to push the nose down. And the flight engineer is now manipulating the thrust levers, trying to jockey the thrust. And while it sounds like they were trying to work as a, uh, as a team and, and good crew coordination, the problem is they were very uncoordinated. And the reason for that is because nobody really ever had a feel for the airplane. As the airplane would start to pitch up, they'd pull the power back, roll the airplane into a bank. When the nose came down, power would come up, ailerons would be rolled so that the airplane would level off and the airplane started to hunt or get into a pilot induced oscillation. They're calling air traffic, they're telling them they're coming back and when you look at the uh, flight data recorder data and the air traffic control radar data, you can see that they are doing a really good job of getting the airplane back around. Now, Rancho Cordova, um, that was an old Air Force base, so there's not a lot of ground lights around that airport. So they're literally flying over a black hole. And as they're milking this airplane around and trying to maintain control, doing those pilot things um, uh, you know, by feel, to, uh, to get the airplane back around. What they weren't monitoring was their out, uh, altitude. And during the course of these pilot-induced oscillations, um, as they were trying to get the airplane back to a final approach, the pitch oscillations became so big and they were only about 900 to 1,000 feet off the ground to begin with. Those pitch oscillations as they were rounding basically a turn towards base to final uh, the pitch oscillation was so great or so large that they ended up striking the ground. And as they were turning, the left wing actually struck a building. And that building was part of an auto salvage yard where there were 10,000 cars in this auto salvage yard. The airplane collided with the ground and then spread itself as it went into self-destruction mode through these 10,000 cars in the auto salvage yard. Um, uh, a large explosive, uh, explosive uh, fire occurred and uh, the fire department got out there and spent a long time trying to extinguish this fire because all these vehicles were there as well. One of the biggest challenges, John, of course, was trying to separate aircraft parts from automobile parts. 
And of course, the premise for accident investigation is trying to determine whether there was a mechanical malfunction or failure that caused or contributed to the accident. But you got to look at the aircraft parts. And it took the team quite a while to filter through car parts, airplane parts, things like that. We'll show you those on, uh, on the website through pictures. But we were also waiting to get information back from the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder so that we could then try to understand what it was that we were looking for. And like you said, John, we all originally thought that there was a cargo shift. So of course, the primary focus is to look at all of what, what's called the bear claws. Though that is, those are the latches that are embedded in the floor that when they put, again, a term of art, cookie sheets, that is, those are the pallets that the cargo is built up on. These weren't in, uh, in containers, they were on cookie sheets. They slide the cookie sheet in and then they clamp them with the bear claws in place throughout the fuselage too. So we had to look at those to see if maybe one or more of those cookie sheets had broken loose and slid to the back of the airplane, causing an FCG. But again, when you have that amount of destruction and that amount of fire damage, it takes a long time to filter those parts and try and find exactly what we were looking for. And, and of course, uh, that, that was the first needle in a haystack. You know, and while, the, while you, after this was going on, after you left the on-scene portion, I happened to be out there in California and I went by the accident scene, took a look at it. And uh, I also got up early in the morning and uh, went out and, and visited with the guys that loaded the airplane. And uh, they told me there was only one cookie sheet on the airplane, the rest were eagles. Well, you got these little eagles and they're not so little. Yeah. You got these eagles in the place, they can't have a load shift because the, the one in front of it can't come back because we got this house in the way. So, yeah. And that's and the process. At the same time, Jolly Pereira, in reviewing the flight data information and comparing it to fine air's load shift in Miami said it doesn't look like a load shift. Yeah, the flight yeah. controls are not moving like a load shift, like it was a load shift. So that changed, that was the point where the complexion of the accident changed. And that's the process of accident investigation is not only looking at what you have that you're working with currently, but you gotta look back at other similar type accidents to see if there are in fact similarities. If there are, then that can guide the investigation. But in this case, like you were just talking about, there were substantial differences in the performance of the airplane, the maneuver or the movement of the flight controls and things like that, that led the team to go in a different direction. And that was that it wasn't a cargo shift, but something else. And the flight data recorder, as soon as we got that and we plotted all that data, and we saw that the airplane auto rotated at about 147 knots. The nose started coming up and the first officer is pushing forward on the control yoke. We knew that something substantial had happened and we started to look at other performance characteristics. That was, of course, the, the movement of the elevator. And when we saw that the elevator wasn't moving in concert with the movement of the airplane, we knew that that's where we needed to focus our attention was now looking at the tail section of the airplane. And again, while that's happening, looking at the hardware, John, you know that we're always looking at the maintenance records and we start sifting through those maintenance records to see who touched where the fingerprints were, if you will, on that tail section. And like you talked about earlier, we knew that that airplane had just had heavy maintenance. We knew that the tail section was a focus of that heavy maintenance. So now you gotta start to marry up all of this information and see how it builds to a storyline. And that storyline, unfortunately, was what you were talking about, that there was a mechanical malfunction due to a maintenance error, whereby the, uh, the system that controls pitch was incorrectly um, put back together again by this young mechanic. Yes, that was painful for me to, to uh, uncover that. You know, we, we uh... We did a lot of work. I went down to that repair facility in Tennessee and talked to the people who did the original work on that airplane, and they were very, very competent. They had been doing those that particular type of work for a long time, 
So it sort of left me scratching my head until the, we got our hands on the, the other records that showed that over the weekend before the crash, I forget how many weeks before, uh, we had uh, a mechanic in there. And then, uh, you know, we got his name, we got the records, and we got the records from the FAA. And then all of a sudden it came clear. I was one of those guys uh, 30 years earlier, 20. 30 years earlier working family John, i worked on the talked about that you can come up with those kind of numbers we know it's it's longer the wright brothers are a lot older than that <laughs> right well i i was one of them guys that worked the weekend on those airplanes so i knew exactly what happened you know and he's a new guy he gets the weekend they give him instructions uh very little instructions it's almost like you're on your own and this poor guy got caught up in it. Now, when, when that bolt um, backed out, what happened with that control arm? Was that the bolt that, that hooked the control arm to the trim tab? Yes. Yes. And so there's when a, there's a big uh, cast piece that's attached to the tab, and the rod comes back uh, with a rod end on it, so it's got swivel in it. And this is the bolt that attaches those two parts together. And when that bolt came out, the rod dropped and got jammed in there. So now it prevented the elevator from commanding nose down. And actually, it was it was jammed in a uh, in a trailing edge up position, about five degrees, if I remember correctly, which already induced as the airplane increased speed on takeoff. It's like somebody had pulled back on the elevator and the airplane wanted to go fly, and it did, um, to the point where they, uh, they got into an extreme nose-up pitch attitude, and it was all the crew could do just to get the nose to come down. And you have to commend the crew and their actions, you know, getting the airplane milked around as far as they did with an unknown problem. It was just for the fact that they weren't monitoring their altitude during these big pitch oscillations. And unfortunately, the last pitch oscillation got him into the ground. So when we talk about this, John, and we talk about the young mechanic, we talk about following procedures and, and, and shortcutting procedures, um, what is it, what's a good takeaway for uh, the mechanics out there that are listening? I mean, everybody has their own style. They've been working on the same airplane or, or an engine or whatever for a very long time. They know ways to be more efficient or workarounds um, and still accomplish the mission. But what's the message here? Uh, the message is, and, and you can catch it from different places, uh, you gotta follow the procedures. General Electric engines, several years ago, uh, monitored all the, all the flights that take off and return for engine problems. And they published a report that said over 50% of those kinds of events. So the airplane has taken off, it's got an engine problem, it comes back, and they found out that over 50% of them were caused by mechanics failing to follow procedures. Wow. And the FAA has long been saying, at least 10 years, have been saying that the number one problem in the industry is failure to follow procedures. It's on the flight deck and it's in the hangar. Now, one of the pet peeves I have about that process is that we spent a lot of money, we being the FAA and, and taxpayer dollars, to help pilots get through the failure to follow procedure place. A lot of training, a lot of additional efforts going. Mm -hmm. There has been none of that in maintenance wow. because they don't have the resources. The FAA yeah. uses their money elsewhere and then it, it comes down. I, I was part of the committee many years ago in the 90s where we actually had a number of maintenance issues. And the FAA came up with a pecking order for their issues. And we were on there. We were on the third page. But the, the money that Congress gave the FAA to deal with those issues ran out on the first page. Wow. So the maintenance well, were never funded to the level they needed to be funded. And one of the things, one of the recommendations, the board made a lot of recommendations out of this particular accident. But one of the recommendations was, of course, to the FAA about that very subject. And they went out, sent a bunch of inspectors out over a short period of time. And they found, they identified well over a hundred instances where 
airline mechanics were not following procedures when they were turning wrenches on airplanes. I mean, where's the oversight, John? Not only by the, the FAA, as because they, they do have a maintenance, a primary or principal maintenance inspector assigned to them, but where's the airline? Where's the management of that airline making sure that their folks are doing what they need to be doing and doing it properly? Yeah, how do you do that with one guy on the clock? One, one mechanic babysitting that airplane over the weekend. I yeah. mean, it's, just, it's a question of economics. The FAA says they don't deal with that. But uh, there's, there's enough lapses between the maintenance people, maintenance management, the company oversight, and the FAA to spread the, the, the dirty hands. It just seems to me that a very simple solution is, okay, yeah, I understand economics, but in the interest of aviation safety and the loss of an airplane, which is really going to boost somebody's economics as far as the insurance and, and things like that, put two people out there, put three people out there on the weekend. You're going to have somebody turn in a wrench. Somebody should look behind, you know, the work and make sure that it's been done, done properly. And if this young guy, which again, we had these crew pairing issues. When you had a new first officer with a captain or you had a, a newly upgraded captain, uh, you know, and they got paired with a young first officer, that spelled trouble. And we put these pairing um, regulations or at least procedures in place where if you had a brand new captain upgrading, you put them with a senior first officer and vice versa because you, you didn't want that, that green pilot uh, you know, or two green pilots in the same cockpit doing something because we've had accidents where both of them were inexperienced enough uh, that bad things happen. Why, I mean, why not do that in the hangar? Yeah, I don't know why they don't do it. They rely upon people. You know, I, I was a crew chief, a lead mechanic uh, on midnight shift, and I had a number of brand new hires come on, and they required uh, watching, if you will. You would, you would spoon feed them into the work. But I had the benefit of having a, a large crew. Yeah, I yeah. had at least 12 people on every night. So I had the benefit of pairing them with some of the senior people and... Uh, you know, and, and in fact, at uh, one point after Eastern Airlines demise, we had uh, picked up, I don't know how many, six, eight, ten of the former Eastern Airlines mechanics with a ton of experience. And I thought that was a godsend because now we could pair them up with uh, new people and, and get them the kind of experience uh, that would be meaningful for them. And well, I, that's why I said earlier about feeling sorry for this young mechanic. Because he stuck out there all alone working on the weekend. Somebody obviously told him that that was a way to get those dampeners out without taking the, disassembling that half that tail. And uh, he was following what he was told. We never dug in to find out who told him. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, that's the other thing I say oftentimes, and you've heard me say it a hundred times, right? Investigations go and they come up to the hangar door and they say, oh, it's maintenance. And that's where they leave it. Yeah. We don't get any of the human factors work from guys like uh, uh, the human factors people at the NTSB who've done a, a, a great job of dissecting pilot problems with, with human factors. But when we get to the hang of human factors, it's forgotten about. It's not well, the big question now and the, really the big issue, and you and I will have to do another show to talk about this. And that is, we know there's a pilot shortage. We know there is a mechanic shortage what is going to happen when you start trying to, again, fill those slots with these inexperienced mechanics? Who's going to be there to oversee them? We know that we have across the board a shortage of, of eyes watching other people um, in the hangars as well as on the flight deck. Um, and are we going to run into more maintenance-related accidents um, because we have that insufficient oversight that we saw in this particular accident. So uh, that's gonna definitely be a discussion that you and I are gonna have as we get more information and maybe we start to see some of this get out into the industry and we start to look at more incidents and accidents with aircraft that are related to um, you know, either improper or inadequate maintenance. So, well, John- I, Actually, I've, I've, been following, I've been following some uh, uh, recent helicopter crashes, and uh, 
I hate to say it, but there's a number of crashes in the helicopter side recently. Not you know, not yesterday, but over an extended time uh, that have maintenance implications. Yeah. Well, um, you know, you, you and I worry about the pilot stuff. Uh, and we definitely are going to be worrying about the maintenance stuff. Uh, you know. And I'm sure that we're going to be talking about air traffic because there is a shortage of air traffic controllers and uh, they too uh, provide a vital service to those of us who actually fly. And we've seen when we had problems and shortages with the controllers, some of the, the issues that that spawned for the aviation industry. But, yeah, I think uh, the FAA, I think the FAA may have uh, taken to heart some of the air traffic problems because uh, I was just talking to a, an air traffic controller who's now about two years into the job and uh, he was saying how they've been sequestering the new people and and not letting them work alone for months so uh, maybe they they learned a lesson over some of the accidents that we were involved with involving air traffic control well good and, good well we have uh, definitely run out of time, but it's uh, always good to see you um, for another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. And I will see you again next week when we're going to dissect uh, another accident. But um, again, we want to thank you for your input, uh, you as the audience, because we, we talked about Emory 17 because of some feedback that we got from a uh, couple of our viewers. Uh, John and I are going to be dissecting a couple of other uh, freight or at least uh, airline accidents involving cargo carriers um, that were again precedent setting type cases and so uh, we're putting those those projects together right now so we look forward to talking uh, with that since it is just you and me i'm going to leave you john as i always do with our last word okay folks as I always say, please, the pandemic's not over. So pay attention to your surroundings when you're out there without a mask. But if you're going to go flying, do a very thorough pre planning session. You can start before you leave your house or the hotel room. Start thinking about your flight. Put your head in the game. When you get to the airport, review everything again, including the weather in route, not just a and point A and B, the weather en route, we've seen a lot of problems uh, and some of them just recently uh, because of the severe weather we've been having in the middle of the country and do a thorough pre-flight. Uh, all too often we see items missed. We see an item missed in this accident that could have prevented the accident. All right, so do a thorough pre-flight, follow the procedures, and if you get in the air, please fly safely. To listen or watch more episodes of this show, go to FlightSafetyDetectives.com, the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel, or your favorite place to listen to podcasts. To contact John and Greg about the show, send them an email at FlightSafetyDetectives at gmail.com. And remember, for aviation insurance needs, contact Avemco Insurance at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Mention Flight Safety Detectives and receive a 5% discount. Thanks for listening to the Flight Safety Detectives and remember to always fly safe.